Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's such a blessing for us to be here together on this day, inshallah. Um, I welcome you all today, inshallah. We're starting our one month endeavor of trying to get through this beautiful book called Revelation. It's written by Miraj Muhyiddin, uh, Dr. Miraj Muhyiddin. And I've been through um, many of the Sira books. I thought this was a really good one for the youth. My name is Mona Islam. Um, I am um, here out of Houston, Texas. I uh, started this as an endeavor for my own daughter um, who is in sixth grade. I have uh, five children and Alhamdulillah with the COVID lockdown, I was actually trying to spend some time doing some Islamic studies with her. And when I was doing that, I just thought since I'm doing it anyway, these are the things I would want my own daughter to know. Why not just allow anyone who also has an interest to join in? So my original intention was just really to share this information with my daughter out of an obligation as a parent. And so um, that's how it all started. And so we, um, you know, we have a group of uh, youth here in Houston. Um, in Ramadan, alhamdulillah, we started off with trying to go through the uh, Quran and so at the middle school age, I was just spending about half an hour going through the gems of the Quran with them on a daily basis. We tried to meet about five days a week. Alhamdulillah, we got through that. And then last month, we just um, yesterday completed a book on spirituality, um, Rising Soul. And in this class, inshallah, we're going to be going through a reading of a book together called Revelation. So um, what I'm going to be doing is referring a lot to the book. It is certainly not required for you to purchase this book. It is not required. You can still benefit from the class, but I might be referring to um, it, but a lot of people do have the book. And so I might be referring to some of the figures and the um, illustrations and the page numbers. So inshallah, you know, uh, just bear with me on that. So one thing um, that I want to start off with is uh, the illustration, which is referred to a lot in this book, is a Q, it's, it's a QY illustration. This QY illustration is based on the years of prophethood. And so we know that, the, uh, that there's 23 years in the prophethood. And the way that this author divides that up is he has a few different ways you can uh, divide out the prophet's life. And so you could look at it as the fact that from the prophet Muhammad Muhammad's birth, until the first revelation, there's 40 years, and then there's 23 years during um, his prophethood. That is one way to divide out, you know, his life. Another way to look at it, um, he also divides it into the Mecca and the Medina years. And so how the Prophet Sallallahu spent 52 years in Mecca and 11 years in Medina with the Hijrah, uh, uh, you know, dividing that, that's another way to look at it. But if you combine all of that, he has the birth of, you know, in Mecca all the way to the first revelation and then 12 years in Mecca and then 11 years in Medina before his death. And so we have like this time period um, during the prophet is like a blue and a green circle. So if you look at those of you that have the book, there's a blue and green uh, color that goes around the circular QY. And so this QY are the Quranic years. And I find that people like my daughter, um, this is my daughter coming in uh, from another class, this is Asma, she's in sixth grade. So when I think of, and I'm an educator, by the way, those of you, um, I'm always thinking, how would children uh, receive this information, right? How would, and she loves her cats, and she loves having the cats join the class. So you are going to see cats like dropped on my head at any random time. So anyways, um, I feel like um, going, having gone through many different, you know, texts before, I felt like the visuals of having some of these help us all learn. So this QY um, illustration right here, the way you can think about it, uh, those of you that have the book, on page 32 of the new edition, um, I, I had uh, both editions. My older edition is in Kuwait with my husband right now, <laughs> but the newer edition. Um, number four, if you look at um, number four, it divides that QI circle into a circle where the top is the Hira and the bottom is the Hijra. Okay, so if you look at it like that, and then uh, if you look at number six, another key division is on the right side and, and divides these into years. Okay, so if you take the whole circle into 24 years, on the right, um, you have at the six year point, you have Hamza and Umar. And then on the left, you have Hudaybiyah at the 18-year point. So then if you take that and make it more of a division, you have 
early Mecca, late Mecca, early Medina, late Medina, okay? And so this is kind of the visual when we refer to the QY years. Moving right along, today's goal, we're actually going to be, um, inshallah, you know, we're hoping for approximately 23 or so plus or minus sessions, if Allah allows. And in that time, I was thinking one way to go about it is to go one year per session, one year of profit, 23 sessions, 23 years. Now, that being said, when I was looking at this book, there's 90 pages on prior to prophethood. Right. So then um, there are some years when there was not a lot going on. So we're going to adjust it. But approximately we're going to go at a rate of approximately one year of profithood per class. And that's going to be plus or minus. So, for example, today we're actually going to cover the first 90 pages of the book, if Allah wills. And that actually is up to the profithood. And so you will find the perfect QY. Um, you will find the perfect QY illustration. Um, right here on page 39 that you can always refer to that perfect for um, you know QY illustration the Quranic year illustration we are next going to talk about the prologue there are four um, parts to the prologue of this book that lead us up to the first year of revelation so you've got p1 p2 p3 and p4 that's how it's divided and so p1 we're going to talk about the early history of Mecca P2 is the Quraysh dynasty. P3 is the seventh century before Muhammad, like what kind of an environment he was being raised into. And P4 is basically the prophet's birth up until prophethood and up until the revelation. Now, that being said, um, what I am doing as this is a walkthrough of the book with you, I have, you know, pre-studied it and kind of going to point out the important parts of that, okay? And so if there's something that's really not as important, I'm going to leave that, and it's up to you if you want to go into that. But my goal is to try to get through this, inshallah, in one month with you in a 30 to 40 minute time period, five days a week. So that is what my goal is. So if you, um, uh, if we can start off at prologue one, page 42, there is a little bit of an opening about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I would like to start with that, where um, Abdullah ibn Harith narrated, I never saw a person who smiled more than the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. Also, Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, who was from the grandchildren of Ali ibn Abi Talib, reported that whenever Ali used to describe the prophet, peace be upon him, he would say, the messenger of Allah was neither very tall nor very short, but of medium stature among the people. His hair was neither very curly nor completely straight. Rather, it was between these two descriptions. We also have another really beautiful description, which says he did not have a Miss Luna, body. Uh, um, can you please mute everyone? It's kind of yes, hard to let hear. Me, uh, let me mute everybody one more time. Um, yeah, I'm going to mute everybody one more time, so that way we don't have the noise. So it says that, um, once again, he did not have a fleshy body or a fully round face. His face was slightly round. His skin color was white with some redness. He had extremely black eyes with long eyelashes. He had large joints and broad shoulders. There was no hair more than normal on his body. And he had a thin line of hair running from the chest to the navel. He had thick hands and feet. When he walked, he lifted his legs with vigor okay. and his steps were firm and strong as if he was descending down a slope. When he wished to look behind, he would turn his whole body and not just the face. The seal of prophethood was situated between his shoulders. He was the seal of the prophets and he had the most generous of hearts and the most truthful of tongue. He was the most kind-hearted and tolerant person ever. He was the best to spend time with due to his awe-inspiring character and kind treatment. Anyone who came across him unexpectedly would become awestruck. And whoever came in close contact with him would love him. One who describes him can only state, I have never seen anyone comparable to him. That was just a bit of an opening which the, um, which the actual author had chosen to collect. Honestly, the majority of today and the majority of this class is a little bit more like historical in nature. So we're going to get right into it. In prologue one on page 43, we are told that there are three types of Arabs that you, that can be categorized. By the way, we do a Kahoot game for the youth at the end. So I will sometimes give you hints that this is a Kahoot question. So Kahoot question number one, we have uh, three categories of Arabs, the perished Arabs, the pure Arabs, and the Arabized Arabs. So some examples of the perished Arabs are the people of Ad and Samud. That is a, a Kahoot Can question. you please repeat that again? 
the yes the perished arabs so there's three types of arabs that the author talks about on page 43 the perished arabs perished the pure arabs and the arabized arabs okay so there's three categories and an example of the perished Arabs would be the Ad and the Thamud, because we know they were perished, right? We know from the stories that we know of that those are some Arab tribes that were destroyed. Absolutely, right? And so there are also pure Arabs on page 44 it describes, and then we have the Arabized Arabs on page 45. If you look at the figure on page 46, figure P4, there are descriptions of the three. This figure right here, tells you the different types of Arabs and examples, right? So some pure Arabs would be Jorhum, Himyar, Kahlan. We also have Arabized Arabs like the Nabataeans, the Adnanians, okay? On uh, P1.2 uh, goes into Ibrahim alayhi salam, also background information. I want to pop in one more point. I have some um, technical policies that you can find on the website. If we are tested with technical difficulties, may Allah save us from that. Sometimes it's related to internet connection, sometimes related to just Zoom regulations that I might not be aware of. Just hang in there. I will try my best to rejoin the class because I have internet and I have a hotspot with me. But um, you know, just try to stay in the class and I'll try to get back to you. If I absolutely so, and then you can always use the class WhatsApp group to support each other. I um during the class, I apologize, I cannot attend to technical issues during the class that would be really you know because every minute of our class really counts so that whatsapp group if you can support each other for technical issues during the class i will try to answer any questions like outside of the class time frame um, additionally yes so a uh, worst case scenario if you personally are having a problem these meetings are being recorded for the most part and they will be uploaded so basically that is kind of like the technical policy if i absolutely cannot reconnect during class, I will let you know on the WhatsApp group, inshallah, okay? So that's just like a short message in case we get text tested in that way. We are now on page 47, where we talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He was born into a family of polytheists, right? And Ibrahim alayhi salam was born into this family of polytheists in the city of Ur, which is, question again, um, in the present day Iraq. In the present day Iraq, Kufa, Iraq, that is where Ibrahim alayhi salam was born. Okay, and I hope all the young people have paid attention to that. His father's name was Azar. Okay, his nephew was Lut. Um, we also know there are many passages which you can find in, in uh, page 47, uh, Surah Maryam, verse 41 to 48, right there, talks about passages about uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his story. Due to time, I'm going to go ahead and let you read that for yourself. He also uh, left his father in Haran um, and continued to Canaan with Sarah. Okay, he continued to Canaan with Sarah and um, uh, and Lut. And as they got uh, older in their age, as we know, they remained childless. They prayed for children. Okay, and so we have um, Ibrahim alayhi salam and the story of like Sarah and Hagar. You know, um, Hajar alayhi salam. Also, in this book, I want to mention that on page 48 and 49, interestingly, uh, the author actually includes passages that are also from Genesis and other sources other than, um, other than just uh, the Quran itself. Discovery of the Zamzam well, Ibrahim Islam lived for an additional 75 years. And uh, so some of the du'as that he made are found on page 51. And so this is a Kahoot question. Surah Ibrahim verse 35 to 37. I'm going to tell you what his dua was, but the answer, when I ask you what was his dua about, the answer to that is he prayed for his descendants, because we know that Ibrahim alayhi salam was much older before he had a single child, and he really wanted children. And so this is what he said to Allah in Surah Ibrahim. He said, my Lord, make this settlement of Mecca tranquil and secure. Keep me and my descendants away from idol worship. My Lord, so many people have been led astray by them. Whoever follows me is of the same mind as me, and whoever disobeys me, well, you are forgiving and merciful. Our Lord, he continued, I've settled some of my descendants in this barren valley next to your sacred house, so they can, our Lord, establish prayer. So make some people sympathetic towards them and supply them with fruits so they can learn to be thankful. What is that about? It's about his descendants. Ibrahim Ali Islam is concerned about his descendants. That is what that dua is about. 
There are some figures and some maps throughout these pages um, as well. We go to the next page where we learn about um, the Jurhum dynasty. So we know that Ibrahim Islam had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. If you go down to the second half of page 52, the Jurhumites were pure Arabs from Yemen who passed through when we know the name of Mecca used to be Becca, right? So it used to be Becca. And um, long before Hajar and Ismail's arrival, okay, then Ismail married the daughter of a Jurhamite chief and had 12 sons who settled throughout Arabia and Syria. He died, according to this book, actually quotes Genesis, but he says, the author says that he died at the age of 137. He left behind his eldest sons in charge. The name of his eldest sons, which is a Kahoot question, is Nabit and Kedar. So the Nabataeans ultimately settled in Northern Arabia, throughout Arabia, whereas Kedar's offspring settled in the region of a peninsula known as the Hijaz, okay? And um, among Kedar's descendants was a man named Adnan who remained in Mecca and founded a group of tribes collectively known as the Adnanian Arabs. Ishaq, on the other hand, we're on page 52. So the two brothers are Nabit and Qidar. Very good question, Aswan, Islam. So Nabit and Qidar are the two eldest sons of Ismail who were left in charge of his affairs when he passed away. So then we look at Ishaq's descendants and they were a little different. They regarded the Kaaba as an Abrahamic temple. Okay, they regarded the Kaaba as an Abrahamic temple and um, even though the pilgrimage, there was still an annual pilgrimage that brought prosperity to Mecca, but as centuries passed, idols from neighboring tribes were gradually introduced back into the Kaaba. There's a true and false question on your Kahoot. There's 20 questions on the Kahoot. So the question is this, um, did the, it, it, well, it, it surrounds this idea that even after Ibrahim alayhi salam, even after Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Kaaba, was not always purely free of idolatry because as we learn here, Ishaq's descendants actually um, you know, came back and uh, brought back idol worship back into the Kaaba after the life of Ibrahim, after the life of Ishaq. So this, um, yes, so it, it basically came back to that. And that is where we talk about the Khuza'a dynasty. Wait, okay. can you please repeat that? Yes. So what I was saying is that Ismail and Ishaq, right? These are the two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We, we, what we said is that Ismail alayhi salam had two of his elder sons who took over his affairs when he died at the age of 137. We're on page 52. I'm gonna go. Okay, so we're on page 52, and Nabit and Qidar are the two elder brothers who took over after Ismail alayhi salam. The Nabataeans and the Qidar. Um, they uh, so the Qidar uh, led to the Adnanites, the Adnanian Arabs. Okay, the Adnanian Arabs. Ishaq, on the other hand, had descendants that were that regarded um, you know the Kaaba as an Abrahamic temple, but they started bringing back the idolatry. So if we look at page fifty three, we uh, talk about on P one five. Okay, is the Khuzara dynasty and the decline of the Abrahamic way. So this is what happened. The Khuza'a did not bother looking for the Zamzam. They actually had a leader named Amr bin Luhai. And um, aside from their idol worship, the Khuza'ites, the Khuza'ites reintroduced a lot of religious practices that were talked about in the Quran. So if you look at page 53 at the bottom half, these are those religious practices that are directly referenced in the Quran, which are wrong, which are part of idolatry. Some of those things, um, you know, I can go, through, you know, because of time, I'll just give you a couple of examples. They dedicated certain portions of food and drink, cattle and crops to the idols, okay? Um, they dedicated animals to the idols. So these are directly out of the Quranic verses. You will find those um, examples on page 53. Moving along, um, on page 54, you have more references to the Quran. And on page 55, there is a really nice figure, P7, which talks about the 12 tribes of Ismail. So if you look at this tribal control of Mecca, right here, this is a very nice one that will tell you a general um, uh, table of the tribal control of Mecca. It goes from, you know, it's got Hajar, Ismail, Jurhum, Khuza'a, and Quraysh, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in detail. If we go to prologue two, we finished one of four. Prologue two, the Quraysh dynasty, 
So 400 years after the birth of Isa alayhi salam, there is a man, a Qurayshi man named Usay, who married the daughter of Hulayl ibn Hubshia, okay, which was the chief of the Khuza'a. He, Hulayl, here's another Kahoot question, Hulayl preferred his son-in-law over his sons when it came to um, passing on the leadership and the power. So there's a Kahoot question, which is going to say that he preferred his sons over his son-in-law. That's false. Because as we learn here on page 56, he actually preferred his son-in-law, who was a non khuzaa to his sons. And then what happened is um, there was a fierce power struggle that occurred, okay? And so this power struggle um, led to some of the groups like Quraysh of the Hollow, Quraysh of the Outskirts, okay? And then we go to the next page, 57. And towards the end of his life, Husay had to pick a successor from his four sons. And so even though, and so here we also have a couple of figures of P8 and P9. These are just some figures that will give you a little bit of the background lineage of some of these uh, pre, you know, ancestral, um, you know, um, some of the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of these pre-ancestral figures. So what we have here is how Qusayf, um, even though Abu Banaf was the most capable, he favored his eldest son, Abu Dhar. Okay, and he was the least promising of the four. But then what happened is, um, uh, you know, half of the Quraysh, so in the next generation, what happened is half of the Quraysh supported his exceptional son Hashem as the tribal leader. Okay, and this included the, the clans of Qusay's younger three sons, the clans of Zahra ibn Taim. And there was a conflict that took place. Here's another Kahoot question. There was a conflict that took place. The way that they came to an agreement is they all rub some perfume on the stone of the Kaaba, and those who supported Hashem became known as the scented ones. That's a Kahoot question as well. So the ones who supported Hashem became known as the scented ones, okay? And um, eventually, uh, some of the tensions caused them to divide the roles, okay? So what we had is they split the leadership roles. Hashem would provide for the pilgrims, while Abu Dar would retain the keys to the Kaaba. So they kind of divided out um, the roles. If we move on quickly, so Hashem was a very powerful uh, leader. He was a skilled leader based on what? He had control over the economic routes taking place over there. So what we had here is uh, there was trading routes to Syria and Yemen. He was so strong and successful in that it's actually referred to in Surah Quraysh. If we um, look at Surah Quraysh, um, on page 58 at the top, these trading routes that Hashem was in charge of are referred to in the Quran, okay? And his actual strength was economic strength. There was actually no other reason for people to come to uh, Mecca other than this religious um, pilgrimage that they did. And what he did is he turned it into a economic, um, you know, relationship between the pilgrimage and the trade routes. So this made him a very powerful leader. Also, um, when he was on a trip to Syria, we're looking at page 59, okay? Uh, he married Selma bint Amr, and she was a woman of the Khuzraj subclan of Najjar. They, they got married, but she had a condition that any child that they have would remain with her in Yathrib. So what child did they have? His name was Sheba. Sheba. Here's a Kahoot question for y'all. Sheba had another name. And the, this name that he had was Abdul Muttalib because when he revisited uh, Mecca, he was thought to be the servant of Muttalib, even though he really wasn't. He was related with him. He was related with him, um, you know, uh, by blood. Wait, Abdul, and, um, Abdul what? Abdul Muttalib. <laughs> Abdul Muttalib. Okay, so he um, he actually was the so Abdul Muttalib married Salma. Okay. And they had a child named Sheba, okay? So moving on to uh, the bottom of 59 on P23, Abdul Muttalib and the recovery of Zamzam. So he, so here we are, Muttalib had chosen his own successor and he passed up his son in favor of his orphaned nephew that was still in Yathrib. After convincing Salma to let her son live among the Quraysh, he returned to Mecca riding on, uh, with Sheba riding behind him. Okay, and the people had never seen Sheba before, so why would they give him leadership? And yet, you know, he, um, so people started calling him Abdul Muttalib. Okay, next paragraph that's important is that Abdul Muttalib lived with his uncle until the latter died during a caravan journey in Yemen. 
and after his death, his brother Nofal forcefully seized control of Banu Hashem, blocking Abdul Muttalib from succeeding his uncle. When the rest of the Quraysh refused to arbitrate, Abdul Muttalib wrote his maternal uncles asking for support. And so this is a description of, um, of a conflict that took place there. Going on to page uh, 60, we learn about how Abdul Muttalib won that. He, had, he promised Allah that if he got 10 sons, if he was blessed with 10 sons, he's going to sacrifice one of them for the sake of Allah. If you look at these figures on page um, 60 and 61, okay, um, I don't want the glare, but page 60 and 61, we have some family um, lineage uh, figures that are nice. And so here we have the sons of Abdul Muttalib, right? So his 10th son, his 10th son's name was Abdullah, Abdullah. So this is also a Kahoot question. His 10th son's name was Abdullah. So now he was faced with a, a situation because he made this promise. I, I'm not sure who's trying to enter. I apologize. Um, yes. Okay. So, so Abdul Muttalib had made this oath previously to God, right? That if I do get blessed with 10 sons, I'm going to sacrifice one. But guess what? His favorite son was Abdullah and that was his 10th son. So he was like, oh my God, what do I do? Like he wanted to find a way out of it. So he kept going and trying to find like alternatives. He, one of the alternatives was to get 10 camels. Um, he kept failing this lot draw that kept happening. Um, he finally came up with the cost of a hundred camels that he was willing to sacrifice to keep Abdullah. Okay. And then um, what one thing that I learned to knew is that he actually, um, you know, um, he wanted to get uh, his son married to Amina, which was Amina bint Wahab from the, from the Quraysh uh, clan of Zuhra. Amina's father passed away and she was under the guardianship of Wahab ibn Manaf. Okay. And so Abdul Muttalib asked for the hand of his niece. And not only did Wahab agree to the union, he also agreed to the marriage of his own daughter, Hala, to Abdul Muttalib. So that was like a little thing that I didn't you know, know before that two sisters, one married Abdullah and one married Abdul Muttalib. So there you have, you know, the parents of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah and Amina. If you go to prologue three, we're on three of four now. Uh, it just, I'm going to do this one briefly, which is the religions that were there in the time before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before the Prophet Muhammad came in as a prophet. Here were some of the things that were out there. Paganism, the... Um, you know, ignorant ways, Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is fire worship. If you look at this nice map on page 63, you look at this nice map on page 50, uh, 63, it shows you that the Arabian Peninsula, the nomads, many of them were, um, they, they were pagans. And it shows you the green area, those of you that have the book, that the fire worshipers were mainly found in Persia. You also had some Judaism and Christianity that were there. So this prologue part just talks about, you know, on, on page 64, touches on the Judaism, the Christianity. Um, a nice chart on page 66 right here, those of you that have this book, um, it talks about how Ibrahim alayhi salam um, had this lineage. He had the two sons of Ishaq and Ismail. And from the Ishaq side, which was with uh, Sarah, you have many of the prophets. You have Musa and Harun. You have Yusuf. Yaku. I'm going to use some of the names that the author used. Um, Job, Jethro, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Ezekiel, Mary, Jesus, Zechariah, and John. These are all coming uh, from the side of Ishaq. And then you have the other side, Ismail, alayhi salam, where you have the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam. So I would encourage you to take a peek at that chart, 60 on page 66, a little bit better. Um, another one that was there was the Hanafism or Hanifism, that is those people who were authentically monotheistic in that time. We also have on P32, on page uh, 68, it talks about some of the empires that surrounded the Quraysh. So some of the empires mentioned are the Roman empires, the Persians, the Ghassanids, Lakhmids, Abyssinians, the Himyarites, and there is a, um, we hear about the story of Abraha. Everybody knows the story of Abraha. So on page 71 on P33, there's a Yemeni attack on Mecca. So what was the motivation of Abraha? Abraha was a man who built a grand cathedral in Yemen. And he called it the Yemeni Kaaba. What was his motivation? He saw the economic power that came with this tourist 
attraction of the Kaaba, he wanted some of that economic power. And that was what he wanted, according to this book, if you look at the top. And so he wanted people to come to his cathedral, but then that didn't settle very well with the Makkans. And so this man named Bunny Kenana, this is a Kahoot question as well. This man named Bunny Kenana actually uh, went into conflict with Abraha. So Abraha takes 60,000 soldiers and many elephants and went to destroy the Kaaba. Okay, that's what he tried to do. If you go to the next page, we know that this is a story out of Surah Fil, the elephant story, which is 105 of the Quran, verse 1 through 5. And there's a nice little figure that gives a little bit more detail. Figure P18 tells you a little bit more description and detail into that. We go to the last page of this section, which Abdul Muttalib's son, Abdullah, okay, he was on a trading expedition to Syria and Palestine. On the way home, he got ill and passed away in Yathrib. Another Kahoot question. I'm going to ask you, he, he and Amina were going to have a baby named Muhammad, but the father of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, did not even get to see his son, okay? And that is a Kahoot question, a true and false question. So, you know, here is Amina. She's expecting her child, but the father did not actually get to see uh, the son. So the Prophet, for the first time, is already orphaned. We're going to go to P4, which is the last of four sections of the prologue, which is page 74. We know that the early childhood of the Prophet, he was born in Mecca, he had a nomadic lifestyle. In that time, people would send their babies to the desert to get nursed, okay? So we have um, Halima, who was married to Habit, who came, and they were trying to um, collect one of these children to nurse them and to take care of them. Now, um, Amina actually did not have like a lot of money to give back, but still Halima and Hadith lovingly took upon this um, responsibility. They raised Muhammad like their own son. Okay. And uh, there's a nice little reference on page 75, about an experience that Prophet Muhammad had during the time. Um, there's an experience he had during his time with Halima. Okay, so during his time with Halima, we're told that there was a passenger, two white men both came to me with a golden basin full of snow. They took me and split my body open. They took out my heart. This is the prophet speaking. They took out my heart, split it open, took it out from the black cot, clot, which they flung away. They washed my heart and my body with that snow until they made them pure. So this is an experience that the prophet had, a very prophetic um, you know, experience he had during his time with Halima. Later at the age of six, hello, Gato, Gatito. At the age of six, Muhammad traveled to Yathrib, right? And um, this is where his mother went to uh, visit her relatives and what happened. At the age of six, Amina, his mother, fell ill and passed away in the town of Abwa. So now for the second time, the Prophet is orphaned. We go on. Um, Abdul Muttalib took care of the Prophet after that. You're right. You're right. Asma is more right than me. You can only be an orphan one time, right? So he actually became an orphan when the uh, when his father passed away. So here we go. Um, he goes and stays with Abdul Muttalib, who takes care of him. Okay. And then before he died, Abdul Muttalib entrusted the Prophet's guardianship to Abu Talib, the full brother um, to uh, to Abdullah's full brother Abu Talib. Okay. Going on to P42, we're wrapping it up. Uh, during the teenage years of the Prophet, um, he, uh, uh, so he actually was a shepherd because that was something he did to support his uncle's family financially. He would herd the uh, sheep. At the age of 12, he accompanied his uncle on a trading caravan to Syria. Here's a question, a Kahoot question, that he um, was spotted by Bahira the monk. Okay, the name is Bahira. And this Bahira, had some um, religious scripts. He had some knowledge of some revelations where he recognized a prophetic person. He actually pulled out and recognized some of the prophetic signs and marks on the prophet as a child. And so here, you know, Bahira recognized him as an Arabian prophet. Um, if we look on the next page, we learn that from shepherdhood, he got some military training, excelled in archery. I want you to know that there were some um, conflicts in the area called Harbal, Hijab, the sacrilegious war, which the Quraysh tribe got pulled into, and the Prophet during his teenage years was known for his valor already during his teenage years. Also, I want you to know on page 80 that there was a pact of chivalry, Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul 
is called the Pact of Chivalry. Okay. We also have um, the Prophet Muhammad in his 20s, which is in, um, uh, yeah, so that's on page 82. So in his mid 20s, what happened with the Prophet? He was involved in the caravan business. He was actually um, becoming financially independent. Okay. Well, Khadija bin Khuwaylid was a wealthy, uh, you know, uh, businesswoman. And she asked the Prophet Muhammad, I'm on page uh, 82. He asked the Prophet Muhammad to take charge of her caravans and paid her twice the amount. And he also gave her a servant named Maisara. They stopped in Bostra, where another Christian monk, Nestor, actually recognized him. This is something that I also learned here. Later, upon returning to Mecca, Maisara told Khadija, who then went to her cousin Waraka, okay, Waraka bin Nafal, and uh, Waraka also, um, you know, uh, uh, agreed about the prophethood. At this point, Khadija was interested in marrying the prophet based on what? If you look at the bottom of 82, why did Khadija want to marry the prophet, a man who is younger than her by 15 years? Because of, it says, um, I love thee for thy trustworthiness, for the beauty of thy character, and the truth of thy speech. So at the beginning, she approached it through, um, the, the proposal uh, came from uh, Nufaisa, approached the uh, prophet, and then Khadija talked to the prophet. And she really liked him for his character, even though he was younger. Let's look at the prophet in his 30s on page 85. And we're just a couple of pages away from finishing the section. So um, in his 30s, we learned that the Prophet Muhammad and Khadija had six children. This is a Kahoot question. Six children. Qasim died. Um, uh, you know, he had Zainab, Ruqayya, Um Kulthum, Fatima, and Abdullah who died in infancy. If you guys refer to figure P25, here's a very nice chart if you look harder into that figure that will tell you the children that he had with Khadija radiallahu anhu. Furthermore, if you look on the next page, um, later, Abu Talib's family was struggling, and that's when he sent over um, Ali, who at that time was not even five years old, went over and added to the Prophet's household. Another nice chart on that page. Um, if we also look at some um, quick info about their daughters and who they married. So here we learned that their eldest daughter, Zainab, uh, Khadija arranged for her to marry her favorite nephew named Abdul As. Ah, favorite nephew, Abu As ibn Abu Rabi, and Ruqayya and Um Kulthum uh, were married to Abu Lahab's sons. So Abu Lahab had high expectations that his nephew would be the leader of the next generation, and he approached Muhammad on behalf of his sons, Utba and Utayba. Okay? And Muhammad وسلم, and Khadija agreed to both of those. You can look at that chart at the bottom of the page, figure P27. On the last page of this section, um, we know that. You know, by his mid-30s, on page 89, Prophet Muhammad had earned the title Al-Amin, which means the trustworthy one. And one of the examples of how he mediated for people was the story of the Black Stone, how there was a, a time when there was a conflict and uh, the tribes were trying to figure out who would place the Black Stone on the Kaaba, but he was the one who uh, was able to come up with a really nice um, idea of placing it on a cloak and then they would all get to place it together. So that is the end of our section. We got through 90 pages um, of the prologue of this book, inshallah. I'm gonna hop over to a quick Kahoot game. Those of you that wanna join, we always have a lot of fun with this Kahoot game. It tests you on your knowledge. So I'm gonna um, switch my screen and share my screen, inshallah. All you have to do is go to kahoot.it. And I think that we talked about every single thing that was here. I am going to share my screen, inshallah, bismillah, share screen. And I'll give you just like a minute or two to log in, inshallah. So here we go. All right, so our PIN number, yes, our PIN number is 9669509. And basically what we do is we have questions that are either, um, it can either be a, a four, you know, there's four choices. I have one question that has two choices, actually. Most of them are multiple choice. Those, you get 10 seconds. I like to give 10 seconds for my questions, and sometimes you have some true and false. So there's kind of like a combination between like the true and false questions. And yeah, this my assistant is Asma. She is like the best assistant in the entire world, mashallah. 
So, and all of you guys are amazing for being here today. I know it's already 3.40, just give us a couple of minutes. I apologize, sometimes we go over time. So here we go, 966-9509. I'm gonna give you one more minute to join in. And I'll tell you what, I will join, I will actually put the, um, a way for you to, a way for you to access this Kahoot at other times. So if you ever wanna do it again, or if you ever want to um, share it with anybody, you're welcome to do that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Bismillah, 966-9509. And it's 20 questions. Are you ready? Number one, Arabs can be classified into three categories, including what? Perished, pure, Arabized, or all of these? Yes, everybody is right. There are three categories of Arabs that we talked about at the beginning. You guys are doing great, mashallah. Number two, Ad and Thamud. Ad and Thamud were what type? Perished, pure, Arabized, or none of these? We gave that example. You're absolutely right. They were the perished Arabs. Exactly. Next question. You guys are doing great, mashallah. Number three, Ibrahim alayhi salam was raised in Ud, which is in present day, which country? Egypt, Iraq, Abyssinia, or Syria? Which country was he raised in? And the answer is Iraq. You guys paid attention very, very well. I'm so proud of all of you, mashallah. Number four, Surah Ibrahim, verse 35 to 37 is about what? We talked about this. Is it more gold to fill the Muslim accounts, a flood to drown the kuffar, a revelation to tell the future, or a prayer for his descendants? And the answer is a prayer for his descendants, mashallah. Ibrahim al is one of the best du'as and um, is a prayer for his descendants. Let's keep going. Number five, true or false? Ismail had two sons named Nabit and Qidar. Is that true or false? Ismail had two sons named Nabit and Qidar. Do you remember their names? Okay. The answer is true. Two of his eldest sons were Nabit and Qidar. That is absolutely true. And the Khuzaites kept monotheism strong. Is that true or false? Did the Khuzaites keep monotheism strong when we talked about Ishaq alayhi salam and what did they bring to the Kaaba? So did the Khuzaites keep monotheism strong? That is false. The Khuzaites did not keep monotheism strong because after Ibrahim alayhi salam and after Ismail and Ishaq, they started bringing back idols to the Kaaba. So the monotheism died down through the Khuzaites, okay? Excellent. The next question, number seven. The Prophet Muhammad was directly a descendant of Adnan by how many generations? I did not tell you that. I'm sorry. The answer is 21. It's my fault. I knew that. I forgot to over I overlooked yeah. that. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the answer is 21. Yeah. So I know some people might have some internet connection issues and, and I'm really sorry. This is just for, for education and for fun. And really like you can always go back to this Kahoot. I'm gonna make sure that it's public. So you, your brothers and sisters, everybody can play it whenever you want, okay? So you guys are doing a great job. Next question, number eight. Hulail preferred his own sons over his son-in-law. Is that true or false? Did he prefer his own sons over his son-in-law? We talked about this, and the answer is false. He actually preferred his son-in-law over his sons. You guys have a powerful memory, mashallah. Paying attention here. Supporters of Hashem became known as what? The warriors, Abraha's army, the scented ones, or none of these. Do you remember the story? And this actually, you got 20 seconds somehow, but we talked about um, the supporters of Hashem, and the answer is they were referred to as the scented ones. Hashem is the powerful ruler who did the economic trade routes. True or false? Hashim was a strong leader with economic skills. Is that true or false? Oh goodness. So what is the answer to that one? And the answer should be exactly. That is true. Hashim was a strong leader with economic skills. That is absolutely true. You guys are still doing great, mashallah. Number 11, Shaiba was also known as what? Do you remember Shaiba? Was he Abdul Muttalib, Hamza, Abu Talib, or Abdullah? Just answer from me.
Sheba was also known as Abdul Muttalib. Absolutely right. You guys got, um, got that right. The next question, we're going to keep going. Number 12, the 10th son of Abdul Muttalib was who? Who was the 10th son? Was it Harith, Abdullah, Abu Lahab, or Zubair? Who was the 10th son of Abdul Muttalib? He did not want to sacrifice him. Yes, you're right. It is Abdullah. That was the father of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next question, number 13. Prophet Muhammad was from which lineage? By the way, I'm going to say PM for Prophet Muhammad. Um, it was Ishaq or Ismail. Which lineage? And we went over this. Which side was Prophet Muhammad from? The answer is Ismail. Exactly. You are perfectly correct. MashaAllah. Number 14. Who started a conflict with Abraha? What was his name? Zayd, Bani Kinana, Abu Sufyan, or Abu Jahl? Who started a conflict with Abraha? He didn't like the Yemeni Kaaba. The answer is Bani Kinana. Okay. And the next question, number 15, true or false? Prophet Muhammad's father, Abdullah, died before seeing his son. Is that true or false? Prophet Muhammad's father, Abdullah, died before seeing his son. you're learning from this right okay 24 of you got that right and that is absolutely true that is when my daughter uh, tells me that he became an orphan and only become an orphan one time halima nursed prophet muhammad in his early years is that true or false halima nursed prophet muhammad in his early years correct that is absolutely correct and the next question, number 17, on a caravan to Syria at the age of 12, who recognized Prophet Muhammad as a prophet? Abu Talib, Qasim, Bahira, or Waraka? Be very careful because it's the one where he's the age of 12. The first one to recognize him when he was on a trade route to Syria was who? The answer is Bahira, exactly. That is perfectly correct. We have some winners here, mashallah. Number 18, what is Hilf al-Fudul? Hilf al-Fudul. Sickness the prophet had, a pact of chivalry, the trench of the war, or none of these. What is the answer to, what is Hilf al-Fudul? And the answer is pact of chivalry. MashaAllah, I'm super proud of you guys. MashaAllah. And we have number 19, true or false. The first wife of the prophet Muhammad was Khadija. Is that true or false? Who was the first wife of the prophet Muhammad that we talked about in this section? Very, very good. The answer is Khadija radiallahu an. We also have our last question. How many children did the Prophet have with Khadija radiallahu an? Was it four, six, 10, or 12? Four, six, 10, or 12? Very, very good. So most of you got that right. And mashallah. Uh, we have a lot of winners today. Uh, my poor daughter, Asma, had some technical problems, even though she's right here next to me. So the internet was not letting her load uh, half the questions. However, I see some amazing um, winners. Because we're already over the time, I don't want to spend too much time. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on, um, on look, you know, um, going over this. I know sometimes we might go over time, and I apologize for that. But I really want to thank everybody for. Um, for coming today from wherever you are. Those of you that are returning, I'm so happy to see you. Those of you that are uh, coming and joining us for the first time, may Allah accept. And we're just gonna do a very quick dua and we'll meet back tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, by the way, um, one of um, the volunteers actually uh, reached out and said she would be willing to see who is interested in purchasing a bulk order of the book since the author did tell me that if we had a bulk order, he might be able to provide some kind of a um, price, which is, um, you know, with no uh, extra charge on him, just the cost price. If you're interested in that, just look on the website. Sister Yasmina is going to be taking care of that sort of a thing. Other than that, we're going to do a quick dua. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu anna ilaha illa anna ashadu anna Can you leave the link on WhatsApp? Wal asr inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amanu salihat wa tawasa bil-haqi wa tawasa bil-sabra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll see you tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.